Welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch and you got uh, not too wet. Lovely Dutch weather we've organized for our guests. It's been it's a great pleasure to um, be able to welcome my good friend Eric, Eric Earl, who actually has never been to Utrecht before. Where have we gone wrong? Uh, we met many years ago when he was at the Bochum uh, Media Study Center. Uh, what a wonderful um, conference on uh, general ecology, media ecology, which is the general topic that Professor Hurl has been working on. A specialist, actually, of not only media studies, media history, and various media topics, but also media philosophies, from Simon Don to Heidegger to Guattari. So very diverse, and like a proper scholar should be, not partisan, not sectarian. And he knows everything, but he's very, very elegant about it. Eric Hurl is currently Professor of Media Culture at the um, Lufana University of Lunenburg in Germany and a member of many, many organizations that have to do with the interface between media, philosophy, and uh, the arts. And his notion of ecology, media ecology, general ecology, I think, will help us understand the contradictions that we're in. Make him feel really welcome because he's very dear to my art. Eric Hurl. Yeah, thank you, Rosie, for introducing me, for inviting me. Thank you, Maria and uh, Buck, for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I have the impression that I follow up a lot of topics, directly a lot of topics we already had uh, this morning, uh, but in a very different way, I guess. So uh, let's start. Uh, the title of my talk is Clear Technology. Um, the general ecologization of thinking, environmental control, and the history of relationality. Uh, the talk has a motto, although I'm not a no Heideggerian, I have a motto, it's not by Heidegger, but by Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, who is somehow very close to Heidegger, of course. An ecology properly understood can be nothing other than a technology. I'm going to present you um, well, about uh, two chapters. The first one is much longer. And I actually, I, I guess uh, it came up this morning uh, when I heard the other talk and the discussion. I will speak about the transformation, why the sentence we had this morning, the rose is already present in the seed, uh, this Aristotelian sentence, is not true anymore. I want to speak about, about this issue. I don't want to say that this sentence has never been true, uh, only that it's lost all the evidence it once might have had. Um, okay, let's start with the first chapter. It's called Ecology's New as a New Historical Semantics. We witness the breakthrough of a new historical uh, semantics, the breakthrough of, I would call it, ecology. There are thousands of ecologies today, ecologies of sensations, I could make up a list, of perception, of cognition, of desire, of attention, of powers, of value, of information, of participation, of media, of the mind, an ecology of relations, of practices, of behavior, of the social, of the political. This morning we had an ecology of uh, the form that Rick brought up, just to name a few examples. There seems to be hardly an area that doesn't turn out to be an uh, object of an ecology and thus to be subject to an ecological reformulation today. This prof proliferation uh, of the ecological comes up uh, with a shift in the meaning of ecology. The concept is increasingly denaturalized, while previously it was politically semantically charged with nature, it now practically calls for an ecology without nature, as Tim Merton put it. It thereby not only goes beyond un any reference of nature, it even occupies primarily unnatural fields. And well, to be honest, it, it also starts to describe a new state of nature even, I would say, we are moving in. That is not uh, the mechanical state of nature we were before. At the same time, in losing this charge, the concept sheds the concomitant and constraining immunopolitical connotation, its amalgamation with dogmas of proximity and immediacy, 
of the familiar and of kinship, of the healthy and the unscathed, of the proper, of the house, of course, etc. In short, its connection with dogmas of authenticity. These dogmas have haunted and reterritorialized the concept of ecology, of course, due to its origin uh, in the Greek oikos and its problematic logocentric heritage and the restricted economy, as uh, Bataille or Derrida would have put it, uh, ever since its genesis in the 19th century. There is something, but there is something remarkable about this shift. While from the perspective of the history of concepts and of discourses, the concept of ecology designated primarily the other side of techniques and of mind formally. It has now began to switch sides, so to speak, within this difference of nature and techniques and to undo the searches that bound it to nature. And it is doing so, that's the point, in parallel or even perhaps even as a result of a fundamental unsettling of this very difference. In the 20th century, this difference is no longer comprehended in the time-honored Aristotelian way from the side of nature. The supplementation of nature by techniques no longer seems to be inscribed in nature and its guarantee of purposes no longer to be circumscribed and regulated by nature, as it was in Arist in, uh, uh, with Aristotle. On the contrary, the very lack of any given purpose becomes undeniable. Techniques emerges as the absolute agent of this lack, and nature begins evidently to be subordinated to techniques uh, I mean, there is a historical shift from techniques to technology, and I think this shift brings this turn. Finally, what emerges in nature's essential technicity, nature will henceforth always already been devoid of all purposes. Uh, to quote Nancy again, there exactly, he tells us, techniques teaches its lesson. It is through techniques that the very nature from, te uh, from which techniques emerged properly reveals its lack of purpose, end of quote. So in strict keeping, or at least in accordance with this non-Aristotelian move of history, I would say, which catapults us from the Western order of teleology, the concept of ecology is pluralized and disseminated. It is outlined and consolidated as the concept of non-natural ecologies, it even mutates into techno-ecology. In this consequential uh, shift, which ultimately will to take up Nancy again, either completely globalize us, leading to an uninhabitable unworld, or mondialize us, creating a world, ecology becomes, becomes a key concept and a signal of the non-modern deterritorialization of the relationship of techniques and nature. So this is one of the salient aspects of non-modernity at all and allows us to decipher the history, and that's my point, of uh, its fascination, of the fascination with non-modernity. Since the fascination with non-modernity is in itself recharged by this deterritorialization and one of its central aspects. The concept of ecology finally allies itself with the new materialisms that struggle at the heart of this fascination today to articulate a non-modern uh, ontology and epistemology. All of this takes place in the wake of already proliferating theories of ecologization that have since the 1970s Came, come uh, to include the mind, this was Gregory Bateson, uh, perception, James Gibson, and of course the psychosocial uh, Guattari, and thus testified to this development very early on. In other words, the comprehensive redescription of modes of existence and of capacities, which has been undertaken for a while now, as if contracts around the concept of ecology, a concept that has, in this move, uh, has itself begun to move. This effort, therefore, ultimately turns out to be a general ecologization of thinking and of theory, a development to which the new historical semantics of ecology testifies. 
So the concept of ecology thus represents a center of a great transformation of the politics of concepts and theories. It is here, I argue, that the rampant fascination with non-modernity, which guides the liberation of this transformation, and I would problemize this also, uh, finds it perhaps most radical systematization articulation. Already at the end of 19th century, but all the more so since 1945, the entry into uh, the technological condition, as I call it, and the mobilization of media technologies have bolstered the formation of first the post and then a non-modernity. In the post-humanist present, this non-modernity is almost acutely conceptualized and integrated in the denaturalized and technologized uh, concept of ecology, with, which is critical of all anthropocentrisms. Ecology has started um, to designate the cooperation today of a variety of human and non-human agents. It forces and drives a radically relational onto epistemological renewal. But to be as clear as possible, uh, semantic traditions change not only in accordance or with social development, as Niklas Luhmann emphasized. I, I'm taking the notion of a new historical semantics from Luhmann. Uh, the emergence of a new historical semantics of ecology thus demonstrates not only societies switch to ecological communication, uh, like as Luhmann says, such as it undoubtedly takes place in the age of the Anthropocene and with regard to the various ecological crises, nor does ecology turn out to be merely an absolute metaphor to speak with Blumenberg, our ecologically endangered society employs to name what it cannot fathom, represent, or fully experience, a metaphor around which our society then would turn, as it were, one that would ecologically re reorganize our body of knowledge and our discourses. Even if such interpretations, which suppose some kind of an ecological unconscious on the part of the episteme, may seem commonsensical somehow, they all adhere to the traditional meaning of ecology. The semantic shift of ecology here, however, goes much deeper. At the very latest, since uh, Friedrich Kittler gave the question of media and techniques a quasi-transcendental turn, uh, we know that at each state, the dominant technical medial condition sediments, not to say, reflects itself, however much re diffracted or you know, refracted it might be. So maybe it diffracts itself in semantic traditions. In the end, I think what is at issue here uh, is the culture of sense that depends on, that is given in media technological strata. This culture is integrated in specific historical uh, semantic sedimentations where it produces its particularities and its anchor, but where it also finds its idiosyncrasies and fixations. This dissemination of the concept of ecology primarily shows, so the thesis I want to defend, a switch in the culture of sense provoked by the entry into the technological condition, a switch from signifying or significant to techno-ecological sense. Uh, the technological evolution then that drives the fundamental neo-ecological of uh, neo-ecologization of thinking and of theory unfolds, roughly speaking, along an axis in machine history, a line we can today decipher as the history of control that still directly dominates the becoming of the concept of ecology. It has developed more precisely since the end of 19th century, and especially since 1950, in an ongoing process of cyberneticization, in an environmental culture of control that is radically distributed and distributive, uh, manifesting computers migrating into the environment in algorithmic and sensorial environments. I, I, thought, I think you had Mark Hansen here also, no? that last year that he spoke, I guess, about this. No? And he will return. So. Yeah, OK. So as we will see in a moment, this culture of control, or not in a moment, because I 
cross this out of my talk. Uh, uh, this culture of control undoubtedly constitutes the apex of the cybernetic imaginary of our time. So the pervasive triumph of the cybernetic hypothesis of universal controllability and uh, the corresponding ideal, if not phantasm, of regulation. I mean, you have this in all, for example, uh, a lot of versions about how to to tackle with the problems of the Anthropocene in what concerns sustainability uh, is, takes place within this phantasm of regulation. We can discuss about this. It entangles us in a new technology of power that has began to act in a specific ecological way and has in any case environmentalized itself to pick up on Foucault, Masumi, and especially on Jennifer Gabris. In this process, media technological infrastructures of distribution render environmental even what used to be called formally just environment. Environmentality, which is first implemented by media technology, is so uh, the contemporary form of governmentality. I think uh, this media ecological issue is, for, is forgotten by Masumi when he brought up this, this notion Although, I mean, he's obs completely obsessed by television, but uh, uh, that's another story, but that's not the, the uh, machinical basis of, of this governmentality, uh, I would say. At the same time, however, the neo-ecological determination of capacities and modes of subjectivation and of environmentalization not only offers but makes possible and conceivable uh, uh, take us beyond this neo-cybernetic power. The techno-ecology of sense, as I call the formation of culture of sense that newly emerges in this opposition, is the central yet like uh, 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 under, little understood event in contemporary history, more precisely in the history of sense, an event that signals a possible opening of neo-cybernetic power. So what is at stake in elucidating the techno-ecology of sense is not only the insight into the core of what contemporary politics of concepts and theories are fascinated with, it touches, I would say, also on the becoming of the project of critique in general as somehow a non-affirmative affirmation of, of this uh, environmental turn. I mean, environmental not in, in the sense, of course, of green ecology, but of environmentality. Bring back the incessant, dismissed concept of sense. Some of you might have been disturbed by this. Carefully taking it up once more is a programmatic move here. Uh, so the, instance on, the insistence on sense, albeit in a new guise, as we will see in a minute, not longer sense in the sense of meaning, signification, but in an asignificant sense of sense, that's in my second part, I come to Gattari uh, to unfold this, resolutely opens the perfect nihilism of technological or cybernetic capitalism in whose immediate proximity, I want to stress this, thrived as we observe today the various dismissals of sense and the very successful, actually, anti-hermeneutic operations of the second half of the 20th century. I don't want to say that they were not right. I just want to say that today we see that this kind of operation was very close uh, to uh, uh, the technological nihilism uh, in the second half of 20th century. What counts instead from the point of view of general ecology is precisely to, I would say, uh, a little emphatic, uh, pathetically maybe, to pass through the radical nothing of technology. Uh, to question anew the relation between techniques and sense, and to reassess the difference for the age of the technological condition. I will come back to this in the second part of my talk. If indeed, as I think it does, the semantic shift toward ecology marks one of the salient changes in the contemporary co politics of concepts and theories, then ecology was not only has not only a dimension of control, as I just said, it's inscribed in this 
in this historical development or evolution even of control culture, but also a dimension that concerns the history of rationality. Uh, I skip a longer part on Luhmann here, but the interesting thing is that f Luhmann already spoke uh, of a rise of, of a new ecological ration uh, rationality, beginning of the 80s, after the functional rationality of modernity, he was completely obsessed actually by. He never described this new ecological rationality, but he was, he was describing, describing again and again the functionalist uh, rationality of modernity. But the very distance, difference of system and environment he used for this, uh, he called in this article the ecological difference. Um, theoretical, the, or another take, the theoretical structure of the ecological question. So the, dif this is the difference of systems and, 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 and uh, environment was for him this theoretical structure, bringing out again him a radical change of uh, the view of the world. Another quote, a radical breakthrough uh, of tradition. I mean, he did not reflect upon the thing that this notion was, of course, a cybernetic thing. Uh, but uh, so you see how deeply inscribed this kind of uh, uh, development of the question of ecology is in the history of machines and of cybernetics. End of uh, this bracket. When Latour later says in the uh, that in the opposition, sees in the opposition of modernizing and ecologizing the decisive oppositions of our time, he merely reiterates the cesura in the, the, cesura in the history of rationality uh, Luhmann already at uh, attested in the beginning of the 80s. So the specifically ecological rationality is characterized I would say, by its radical revaluation of relationality. It places a prime on relations and leads to an essentially non, I would say, non-philosophical politics of relations. That's the important thing. This is evident already in the dominance of concepts of relation in neo-ecological thought, of course. I mean, in Masumi, Manning, Toscano, uh, Debes, Parisi, of course, Shaviro, uh, and if you want to include also somehow Latour. Um, of course, a focus on rational, re, relationality, talk of the dawn of an age of relational thinking and of a relational culture of knowledge can be found throughout 20th century and has been long sedimented in the very foundation of the philosophical self-conception of the 20th century. I mean, that's first of all, nothing new. From the beginning, since Kassira, Whitehead, Bachelard, it has been a question of relational epistemology, that's Bachelard, of course, uh, ontology, Whitehead, and cosmology, and Kassira is in between. But from today's perspective, I would say, the intensification and the establishment of the great relational switch did not take place until after these important elaborations of the beginning of the century. Or oh, that's the reason of the, of the rereading of all these authors that happens today, especially of Whitehead. Following a longer period of latency, the transition from the paradigm of being in the middle uh, to that of being relational, like uh, Didier de Best puts it, began to differentiate itself ecologically, that's my point. When the process of ecologization has begun to take in all the apparatuses of expression of our uh, age, and the new ecological paradigm has become to dominate the powers of thinking, philosophically, knowing scientifically, acting politically, and finally the aesthetic power of feeling uh, equally, to take up Qatari here for the first time, really. It is no longer the site uh, where the other of rationality or of the mind crystallize it, as it has been before. Even if the anti-modern, anti-modernism of a certain kind of the ecological, because actually ecology is a difficult and politically very difficult term, especially in Germany, you know, uh, uh, it was a, it, it was a, uh, beginning of the 19th, uh, uh, 20th century, end of the 19th century, it was a notion of the 
conservative revolution, even, I have to say, and it was heavily used also uh, by the, by the uh, Nazis. So even if the anti-modernism of a certain kind of the ecological has long believed this to be the case, what emerges here, on the contrary, is a form of rationality that rejects the previous forms as too restricted and begins to take uh, the real excessive wealth of relations into account. Ecologization comprehends the reconceptualization of modes of existence, faculties, and forms of life in terms of relations. According to Daltour, for example, modernity is, quote, to lose the experience of relations, quote, end of quote, to reduce the multitude of relations to a few essential relations, moreover said to be secondary, whereas he urges precisely in the name of ecology a new ontological realism of relations. For Latour's relational enthusiasm, I would call it, a relationalism is always already non-modern. But today, that's much more interesting than Latour, we have especially post-structuralist anthropologists, uh, elaborations of a relational perspective like Tim Ingall says, a relational stance, Alf Hornburg, or a perspectivist, quote, universe that is 100% relational, as Viveros de Castro puts it. Uh, our traditional, uh, sorry, what is this? Our traditional problem in the West, he says, Viveros, is how to connect and universal, universalize. Individual substances are given while relations are to be made. The Amer Indian problem is how to separate and particularize. Relations are given while substances must be defined. This precisely is the break in the history of uh, rationality at issue here. Ultimately, and this to me seems to be the apex of this transformation, ecologization gives rise to a new ecological image of thought of thought that assigns a fundamentally uh, different value to the question of relation. Far from being only the question of more or less relations to be considered, as Latour puts it, huh, to be considered, it radically has to reconceptualize relationality as such. This would be the claim, and not more or less. Unlike the enduring heritage of scholasticism, it does not turn relations into minor and derivative entities, but considers them to be originary. In so doing, it institutes a non-philosophical politics of relation. General ecology is a non-philosophical rethinking of relation. And uh, I put in my German uh, text actually not uh, I, another word, it's called Bezug. There, there we have Beziehung, that's relation, but Bezug is something different. I don't know how to... Uh, how to translate it, maybe rapport or something. Well, I come to this later. Yet one has to take care not to lapse into, and that's probably the most important point, in a political romantics of relation. Even this general ecological relationism is still inscribed to a certain extent within the history of control, again. Its point of departure in any case lies in a highly problematic space and should in no way be mystified political romantically, nor should it be mistaken for the merely emancipatory content of a new scientific spirit or so. For today, we find ourselves at a very specific point in the history of relationality that brings out or exposes the question and the problem of relationality much more radically than ever before, I would say. Relational technologies, and an algorithmic uh, governmentality reduce, regulate, control, even capitalize relations to an enormous extent. Nigel Thrift very appropriately speaks, therefore, of an augmented relationality uh, that makes these exploitations uh, of uh, relations possible. There is, in other words, a he there to unsee neoliberal capitalist destruction of relation, a, re a reduction of relations to calculable, rationalizable, exploitable ratios, such as the mathematics of power to take up Alex Galloway here, forcefully operates them. 
the general ecology of relation and the non-philosophical politics of relation it promotes is diametrically opposed to this uh, mathematics of relations. Mathematics is unaware uh, of the intensity and originariness of the relation that establishes the terms of a relation, the relata, in the first place. Maybe not the mathematics um, Luciana Parisi wants to talk about here because she has a hope uh, that uh, I would say that the non-logocentric uh, uh, new mathematics, mathematics uh, a new algorithmic uh, new cultures of mathematics with growing algorithms, algorithms is coming up. Huh? So, uh, but we can discuss about this. This was also the dream, for example, of, of John von Neumann and others around 1950, when he wrote about uh, the brain and the computer. Uh, I mean, he was one of the most famous mathematicians of his time, responsible for all the calculations of the atomic bomb and uh, of the Wasserstoffbombe, the, what is called? Hydrogen the hydrogen bomb, and he, uh, before he died, he had the vision that maybe there is, a, there is a wild mathematics of the brain, and the known mathematics is only, a, is only a, gives us only a very little glimpse of this natural mathematics of the brain that's going on, and he expressed the hope that the new uh, general mathematics could come up. Uh, and yeah, so this, I would say, some dreams of new mathematics are uh, already old. So I lost completely where I am. Um, so mathematics, I speak of the, uh, you, of the uh, mathematics as we know it today, is unaware of the intensity and originaries of the relation. It is unaware uh, of becoming as, and again, Viveros, uh, the Castro, uh, as a movement that deterritorializes the two terms of the relation, he says, it creates by extracting them from the relations, defining them in order to link them via a new partial connection. It only knows of, I would say, mathematics, extensive vectored relations between pre-given terms, terms that already precede the relation, terms that are, that are but do not become so the dominance of the mathematical, that's the only time I take up the notion of Heidegger, die Herrschaft des Mathematischen, re-territorializes relations, whereas the knowledge of recent anthropological work, and that's the point why I'm interested in, in the anthropologists, uh, in particular, deterritorializes relations and drives the elaboration of a real relational eco ecologism. In other words, what we need is some kind of pharmacology of relations uh, to take up uh, Derrida and Stiegler here. Uh, I'm working now uh, currently uh, in a bigger project on only one mode of relation uh, that seems for me to be very important uh, today, that's participation, and I try to describe the revaluation of a participation that was once one of the key items, of course, of, of Platonism, the re-elaboration of, uh, of the relation of participation in 20th century, a, a philosophical line from Levi Brühl up to uh, Simon Don and others, and a more anthropological line, especially focusing post-structural -anthropolo uh, post anthropologists. Um, and this kind of participation has nothing to do with um, political participation or participation on the web, like communication studies uh, tries, to, tries to, uh, to emphasize. Another possibility, Rosie, would be uh, symbiosis. Symbiosis is also one of the relations that could be studied uh, uh, and could be interesting for such a project. It came, up, came to my mind when you mentioned um, before Lynn Margulis. Unfortunately, I have to skip my deeper development of the process of cybernetization here, uh, which I guess, together with James Benninger, starts already in the 19th century uh, with the so-called crisis of control I mentioned before, um, triggered by massive flows of commodities, energies, money, and uh, desires. Control, regulation, planning became 
end of 19th century problems characterizing uh, a whole age, life itself even became a control problem, then history turned out to be a history of control. And Benninger is not aware of this because he starts to describe the history of mankind as the history of control from the beginning, you know, up to his time. So there you see that uh, the control crisis even changed this, uh, uh, the whole enterprise or, or the whole view on history, what it could be. First order cybernetics then uh, happened already deep within this age of control, was not like, for example, Peter Gellison and others uh, uh, claimed, uh, and as I claimed myself to the last 10 years, a mere consequence of Second World War and all in all an ontology of the enemy. So you have different stages of cyberneticization then going on, several kinds of cybernetics, first, second, and finally, uh, third cybernetics, I would call cybernetics today. And during this process, ending up uh, in the explosion of environmental agency, and that's exactly what I would call third cybernetics, highly environmentalized cybernetics, uh, due to new radically distributed and distributing media technologies, environmentality has been exposed as a problem. So environmentality, I would stress, is the third uh, uh, cybernetics. Important for my reading of, of Gautrelli, I will do in a second, is already second order cybernetics addressed the environment, of course, as environment of a system in a less trivializing way than before, that's important. I mean, still one of the leading uh, uh, cyberneticians, second order cyberneticians, um, uh, Heinz von Förster, he spoke about the environment uh, in a different way than, because for the first order cybernetics, the environment was only a problem of adaptation. And for the second order cybernetics, then he's, uh, uh, Instead of adaptation, what came up was the problem of learning. A system has had not to adapt, but to learn. So the, the, the notion of, of uh, the, the problem of environment be, became already much more important. But uh, Heinz von Förster, who inaugurated the second order cybernetics, or was one of the inaugurators, he said still, of course, that what we need is to trivialize the environment. That's the, op that's the most important operation. So this was the view from inside uh, the difference of systems and environment. Environment was only problematic insofar as the system was and is coupled with it. This phase in the, uh, in the first to be generally is the first to be uh, genuinely uh, environmental. Its main problem is control, management, modulation of behavior, of affects, of relationships, of intensities, and of forces by means of environmental media technologies that ultimately borders to the cosmic, on the cosmic, I would say. So the established powers the Lösen Gatteri speak of in Mill Plateau are increasingly organized eco, even cosmo technologically. All these phenomena in our, and the diagram of power have now become an object of ecology. They can only be grasped in ecological terms. This is the result of the history of control in whose third environmental phase, the cybernetic state of nature, today fully comes into its own. This must be our point of departure. So I'm still at the point of departure of the 10 pages. Uh, if we seek to understand the penetrating power of ecological semantics, a semantics that in the end, a point that bears repeating, serves to operate a fundamental critique of this movement of environmentalization on the level of ontological and epistemological theorizing. Um, I have to skip now uh, the last point uh, of this first section, uh, taking on Peter Heff. This would have been interesting uh, uh, when I think about the discussions we, because we had before, because Peter Heff is a, is a geologist who brought up the notion of the technosphere. And technosphere, uh, after what, what we have, lithosphere, uh, hydrosphere, uh, uh, atmosphere and biosphere. And he says now, we, uh, industrialization brought uh, the, 
the, uh, brought up a new sphere. Uh, uh, he calls it the technosphere, the new technological paradigm of the Earth. And uh, the interesting point is, Rosie, that we will go on. Uh, th there was the big, uh, this big, two, the big sessions we had on un the Anthropocene at the HKW in Berlin for two years or even longer. And we want to go on now uh, to discuss two years the question of technosphere and how to describe this and discuss it and so on and open the notion. And therefore, I offered it for the glossary. Uh, 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 we, we are, I, I want to contribute on the posthuman glossary. Uh, and so the technosphere is even not a techno ecology, he calls it techno geology. Uh, that's the interesting point. And it's interesting because it's somehow a radicalization uh, of the Landas material. Uh, I can't read what I read before. Of the Landas uh, mineralization of urban exoskeleton you brought up, because that's somehow the next step to, to have an, a whole earth paradigm called uh, technogeology, because that's all about these processes in, in Peter Heff. And what, what Heff is showing is that this, the rise of this paradigm is the end of what I would call the anthropocenic illusion. Uh, I mean, um, what is the anthropocenic illusion? Uh, there is an explosion of agencies shown by this technosphere, uh, this puts an end to the human monopolization of agency that always already has been an illusion, that brought this kind of technicization, but, you know, open, open uh, exploded in this, uh, uh, let explode the anthropocenic uh, illusion. Second part, much shorter, techno-ecological sense. Sense, too, sense especially, is subject to historicality. The difference between sense and techniques, the historical transformation of its heretofore dominant aspect, and thus the changes in its internal economy, I mean the internal economy of this difference of sense and techniques, are central for understanding where we are today in the history of sense. In the first half of 20th century, Husserl, uh, uh, who came up earlier, warned against the dangerous displacement of sense provoked by increasing technicization and mathematization. He considered the threat and horizon of the crisis of Western science to consist in a, to cons uh, in a total loss of sense, he said, and totaler Sinnverlust, a scientifically, technically induced crisis and destruction of sense. Sinzerstörung. His warning is an expression of a traditional philosophical politics of sense, which in turn belongs to a very specific formation in the history of sense that cannot be characterized solely by the opposition of sense and techniques consistently organized by uh, philosophical politics, I would say. What is decided with rather is, again, that one side of the, of the difference is subject to the other. Technics is always subjected to sense and above all to the sense-giving subject. Inversely, every shift of emphasis toward techniques can, uh, in this uh, economy of a difference, in the end only lead to a collapse of sense. So in this philosophical scenario. But since then, this philosophical politics of sense, which Deleuze has so convincingly depicted as the corollary of a dogmatic image of thought beholden to representation, has increasingly lost its persuasive force. The valence expressed in the difference between sense and techniques, and in the subjection of techniques under sense, the valence that organized the philosophical politics of sense Fixed, fixated on representation and signification, has forfeit its epochal self-evidence. But not because we have entered some kind of no holes bared nihilism of technologization that would once and for all ruin this difference as such. We have merely, as a result of this general cybernetization, transition to a different configuration in the history of sense, which in turn is characterized by a surprising revaluation of the difference between sense and techniques. Uh, 
This revaluation runs parallel to the real revaluation just described of the difference of nature, between nature and techniques, which it even supplements, and to which it is, of course, essentially linked. I mean, this, this transformation goes, this both goes together, go together. In precisely this intrinsic link, in this twofold fact of difference politics, difference politics, the technological condition comes to the fore. Perhaps no one is clearer on this revaluation as Jean-Luc Nancy, who writes, I mean, as Jean-Luc Nancy, because he comes out of a phenomenological tradition he, that, that believed on this former difference of science and techniques, he writes, to inhabit, again, the dwelling, no, to inhabit technology or to welcome it would be nothing other than inhabiting and welcoming the finitude of sense. Rather, it is a matter of getting at the sense of technology as the sense of existence. The reign of technology disassembles and disorients in infinite, the infinite ceiling of, of a sense, and a sense, of course, sense written with a capital letter. Sentences like these, which define techniques against the traditional notion of the infinity of sense as the bearer of radical purposelessness and of affinity of sense, are almost paradigmatic indicators of the switch at issue here. They organize uh, the revaluation of sense that moves from sense in a sense of meaning, of, refer of referential sense, to a different sense of sense, a sense after the primacy of endowing with sense, a sense no longer to be given, no longer lost and to be restored, no longer sedimented and no longer to be discovered. That cesura this marks in the history of sense is tremendous where we once found the anti-technical bulwark of sense, we now all of a sudden see the technicity, the original technicity and mediality of sense. The switch in the philosophical politics of sense that takes place between Husserl and Nancy, and I, I just have chosen these two because it shows the move within one, one philosophical tradition, the phenomenological one, who was obviously the one that really had the problem of sense and the problem of techniques. So this switch ultimately um, uh, even the transition from a philosophical to a non-philosophical politics of sense, at least announcing itself here, marks the emergence of the formation of techno-ecological sense, as I would like to call this new formation. Yet this modifies the concept of sense as a whole. The cult of the sign and of meaning that characterizes the traditional culture of sense, most often supported by non-technical speaking signifying uh, writing and reading subject of sense turns out to be an essentially pre-technical illusion or pre-technological, I would say. It's always tricky to translate techno technology and technology. It's not the same somehow. Felix Gattery has mounted this great challenge to the domination of language, uh, which attacks the core and the evidence of an entire formation and which today is carried on for example, under the title of affect. Gattari did uh, this practically in parallel with Nancy, even if this strange simultaneity has uh, far not been understood philosophically. That is why Gattari is beside Nancy, one of the central theoreticians of this cesura in the history of sense uh, and the technological culture of sense that emerges from it, especially since his work leads to an ecosophy that has remained a fragment, as well as Nancy's, I say in, uh, in brackets, ecotechny eco is also a fragment, a fragment endangering his whole work, I guess, his whole philosophical work. If he would work it out, he would have to leave phenomenological tradition much more than he did until today. Gattari's difficult difference between significant and non-significant semiotics, which he struggled to develop since at the latest, the late 1970s, and which probably constitutes the core of his reformulation of the critical project, may account at the very least 
as a heuristic, a guiding difference for the redescription of the cultural sense made necessary uh, by the techno-ecological condition. After an initial focus on the question of a new machinic, and that means first of all non-linguistic model of unconsciousness, Gattari in the end worked toward a transversal uh, most of you might know, and had a regenetic reconciliation of subjectivity to decenter the traditional subject of the culture of meaning toward discovering a signifying machines of subjectivations in which he saw the main question, the core problem, but also the emancipatory potential of the techno-ecologically transformed present, which he called himself post-mediality or post-media era. This is where the historical crystallization horizon of what he explicitly calls the generalized ecology, ecology generalisé, or ecosophy, is to be found. So according to, to Gattari, this generalized ecology, I just mentioned it uh, shortly, merges the three decisive ecological fields of environment, social relations, and human subjectivity, material, social, mental ecology, and meets the concern, concerns of a new type of rationality that he calls eco-logic. So I'm back again in this issue. Maurizio Lazzarato has recently given a detailed exposition of this central difference in Gattari's thought that in my reading rearranges the relationship between techniques and sense in the technological condition. He demonstrates just how valuable it is for a diagnosis of the contemporary situation. We live, he, I mean Lazzarato writes, in the machine-centric world, no longer in a logocentric world, that configures the functions of language in an entirely new way, and even fundamentally reconfigures the very sight of language. Quote uh, um, Lazzarato, we are faced with an immense machinic fulum, he continues, that in one way or another affects us and forces us beyond logocentrism, end of quote. For Lazzarato, Gattari's entire program arises from the machinocentric turn. Already several years before the heyday of the history of control in the years we are living in, Gattari's program draws its conclusions and represents the first figure of this new uh, world. Lazzarato writes, in the machine-centric universe, one moves from the question of the subject to that of subjectivity, such that enunciation does not primarily refer to the speakers and listeners, writers and readers, and so on, um, the communicational version of individualism, but to, and this is a quote of Gattari in the quote then, but to complex assemblages of individuals, bodies, materials, and social machines, semiotic, mathematical, and scientific machines, etc., which are the true sources of enunciation, end of quote. The sign machines of money, uh, end of Gattari quote, the sign machines of money, economic science, technology, art, and so on, uh, he goes on, function in parallel or independency because they produce or convey meaning and in this way bypass language, significations, and representations. In la, end of quote. In Lazzarato's persuasive, persuasive interpretation, Gattari's elaboration of a general semiotics which comprises not just signifying speech, but aesthetics, scientific, technical, biological, and so on, sign machines, as well is the semiotics of the machinocentric world. It no longer works within the semiotic triangle, to quote Gattari, reference, signification, representation, that's still applicable, applicable and only applicable under logocentric conditions. It thus reacts to the rise of the non-linguistic regime of enunciation, of the technological sense culture that is primarily based on different asignificant semiotics such as software and program languages, algorithms, mathematical equations, diagrams, stock market indices, and so on. They move out of the house of language then prompted, even implemented by the total cybernetization of forms of life and existence. Gattari elsewhere describes as the implementation of the new aesthetic paradigm that in turn uh, 
is subject to an environmentality of now operating effectively, I would say. Uh, I try to be a bit faster. Uh, at issue here is not a simple historical transition from signifying to asignifying semiotics that would reflect the switch from a logocentric to a machinocentric world. In principle, there have always been many modes of semiotization that integrate, according to Gattori, that integrate in more or less complex assemblages of enunciation in which they crystallize subjectivity. This reveals them to be closely linked to modes of subjectivation and valuation, and thus to be particular structural formations of types of uh, culture of sense. Yet there are, according to Gattari, um, historical changes in the configuration of various modes of semitization vis-a-vis each other. More precisely, there is somehow a becoming, something like a becoming, an evolution of assemblages of enunciation that in the second half of 20th century are on the verge of transitioning to a new formation of interlocking modes of semitization, subjectivation, valuation, modes for which Gattari himself begins to provide an ecosophic model in the 1980s. Kateri's ecosophy is a perspectivation of this transition. For Kateri, this becoming contains the very essence of historicality, I would say. Tasks with its descriptions are speculative maps of subjectivity, thus initially territorialized assemblages of enunciation were engendered by diverse initiatory social rhetorical machines embedded in clan, religion, military, corporal, etc. institution, as he says, which he brings together, quote again, under the general rubric collective apparatuses of signification. He calls it, called it once also collective infrastructures, for example. This was, this was of course, so-called archaic machinism, it was a foreboding, uh, I would say, forearmung, uh, as it were, of the machinocentric world implemented by media technologies in the, quote, Gattari, age of planetary computerization. Or one could put it inversely, the entry of subjectivity into the machine, the genesis of a machinic subjectivity of a new type that Gattari sees moving in thanks to recent media technologies in the machin machinicized uh, present, strangely repeats or imitates this archaic machinism. Animism and machinocentrism thus shed light each, other, each on the other, which makes re-readings of animistic systems relevant to an interpretation of today's technological condition. This, that's a prospering field, so to speak. Between them lies then a logocentric world that delimits the variety of modes of semiotization that means the world of modernity's re-territorialized, capitalized subjectivity. The extent to which capitalism breaks into territorialized assemblages of enunciation and deterritorializes them is the extent to which it ultimately subjects them, and that's an important point for me, to the general equivalent as the emblem and the apex of the regime of signification. This is the central operation, and according to Gattari, it pushes back all asignificant semiotics until their return with regained strength in the machinic couplings of human and non-human forces in cybernetic capitalism. And let me just note in passing that this is the point at which Gattari seems to be hounded, on the one hand, seems to be hounded by a fascination with non-modernity, a fascination that has become significant for contemporary thinking as a whole, and not least importantly, has left its marks, of course, also in the general ec ecologization of thinking. And Gattari is one of the of, of well, one of the one of the key figures that 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 caused somehow this fascination with non-modernity. But in his return, but in return, he's all he offers also a completely other reading, that our problem is not that of modernization versus non-modernization, respectively ecologization, but modernity um, is anyway much more polymorphic than all the counter-modernists 
do want to make us believe maybe. But that what is at stake with the ecologization of theory and thinking is the dominance of the general equivalent in all its forms. It means not only capital, but he says being uh, and also uh, the sig signifier. So Gattari's, and, um, yeah. Gattari's interest in the re reappearance and regained strength of asignifying semiotics or in stepping out from the signifying culture of sense of the general equivalent is central for coming to grips with this ecosophic program and at the same time indicates the precise historical position of his endeavor. Ecosophy, that was a term that he, of, uh, he really uh, prefers to ecology, is the name uh, Gattari suggests for a fundamentally reformed way of ontological ecological modeling on a par with its epoch in the history of sense. Um, down to its innermost modes of conceptualization, ecosophy is a different result of the general process of cybernetization that characterizes 20th century. Five minutes? It, yeah. it undertakes an offensive expansion of ecosystem thinking, which in turn, viewed from the perspective of the history of knowledge and of media, is profoundly cybernetic and constitutes an integral moment in the rise of the ideal of control. While as Gattari writes in Cosmosis, the, quote, ecosystemic approach of fluxes already represents still quote, an indispensable awareness of the cybernetic interaction and feedback involved with living organisms and social structures. The ecosophic, end of quote, the ecosophic approach operates an extension by, again quote, establishing a transversalist bridge between the ensemble of ontological strata, which each in their own way are characterized by specific figures of cosmosis, end of quote. These strata range from material and energetic fluxes via the strata of organic life to those of the socios and the mechanosphere all the way to the, quote, incorporeal universes of music, mathematical idealities, becomings of desire. Modeling the ecosophic object, therefore, includes the four ontological dimensions of fluxes, territories, universes, and machinic fühler. Being must be, he says, conceived, quote, from a multi-componential and intensive perspective, end of quote. This is the ecosophic slogan that ultimately undermines every talk of being as such and allows only for the description of multiple modes of being and existence. Ecosophic mapping or metamodeling is a method for describing the various ontological strata and textures that only come into view in the techno-ecological culture of sense, that is, after the signifying culture of sense, uh, precisely, that precisely included the search for the meaning of being and the general equivalent. Moreover, as already foreshadowed, it is generalized ecosystemic mode of thinking in, its, in this generalized mode of thinking that he affirmed. Uh, the ecosophic project is deeply marked uh, also and above all in its general machinism by the process of cybernetization and the technological condition, which allow for a completely new conception of the machine in the first place, allegedly beyond the, what he called himself, fascination with technology, quote uh, of of, of Gattari. The new type of assemblage characterized by Gattari, the processual machinic assemblage, even picks up explicitly on Varela's and Maturana's new cybernetic concept of autopoiesis, the concept of a self producing and self reproducing machine, understood as, quote, the ensemble of interrelations and its components. Varela and Maturana, as Gattari notes, reserved this concept for living machines, whereas they conceived of all others, from social systems to technical machines, in terms of, quote Gattari, an allopoiesis, not an autopoiesis, in which the machine will search for its components outside of itself. So only organisms were their autopoietic machines, the rest were allopoietic machines. Um, Gattari's general machinism, on which the conceptualization of his generalized ecology is based, 
opts for a combination of auto and allopoiesis. In the late lecture on machines, delivered in November 1990, this becomes quite evident. Uh, I would propose, he writes, a reversal of this point of view to the extent that the problem of technique would now only be a subsidiary part of a much wider machine problematic, since the machine is opened out towards its machinic environment and maintains all sorts of relationships with social constituents and individual subjectivities. The concept of technological machine should therefore be broadened to that of a machinic age uh, agencements. This category encompasses uh, where I, oh yeah, everything that develops as a machine in its different registers and ontological supports. And here, rather than having an opposition between being and the machine or being and the subject, this new notion of the machine now involves being differentiating itself qualitatively and emerging onto an ontological plurality, which is the very extension of the creativity of machinic vectors. Rather than having A being as a common trait, which would inhabit the whole of machinic, social, human, and cosmic beings, we have instead a machine that develops universes of reference, ontological heterogeneous universes, which are marked by historic turning points, effect of irreversibility and singularity, end of quote. So this quote would, of course, deserve a long coma, a comment let me just point to the opening of the machine towards its machinic environment, where one can see the techno-ecological transformation at work. Ultimately, Gattari's ecosophic machinism represents an early radical reading of the technological condition and culminates in a general semiotics. It allows us to, re to think a core moment of today's uh, sense culture effective environmentality of the third cybernetics being implemented by media technologies without the detour we are human subjects and meaning. In other words, it makes it possible, as Laterazzo tells us, to quote, capture of non-human phenomena and relation by asignifying semiotic systems, end of quote. The ecosophic project, project thus positions itself as such at precisely the point where the histories of control, rationality, and relationality intersect at the point from which our neo-ecological present unfolds. Thank you for your attendance.